play to potential. Nugget. The other piece uh, which personally struck me was this notion of uh, laying the foundation for the second half of your career in the first half. And I say uh, specifically in my context is as I look at my peers who graduated with me from, let's say, an IMA, a lot of them are sort of at that interesting inflection point where they're close to 20 years of experience and uh, one can see the different uh, momentums with which people are moving into the second stage. Talk to us a little bit about... Uh, you know, what you mean here? What's the foundation people can lay in the first half that helps them in the second half? No, in the book, uh, Catalyst, one of my strong beliefs is that the first half is a catalyst for the second half. Yeah, and I think that's the way I like to frame it. But it's actually useful to start with a story, uh, the hare and the tortoise story, as we have all heard, which is a race between the hare and the tortoise with the tortoise wins because the hare kind of becomes lazy. And the moral of the story is slow and steady wins the race. So sometimes as I do these sessions, I ask people, do you like slow and steady wins the race as a moral for carriers? And typically the young people don't like it. They don't like slow, you know, uh, in anything. And I also don't advocate people being the tortoise in their carriers. But I certainly advocate and say, don't try and be the rabbit in your career. No cricket match can be won in the first five hours of the match. Yeah. Similarly, no career can be won in the first 5-10 years of your career. Yeah. Uh, and if you examine careers, I have noticed two things. The first thing I have noticed is, most people succeed in the first half of their careers. Equally, I have noticed very few succeed in the second half of their careers. Yeah. And sometimes I like to say it provocatively, to say even idiots succeed in the first half of their careers. And even good people fail in the second half of their careers. Yeah. So, if you want a great career, you got to solve the problem of how am I going to be successful when I get to the second half. That's the key problem to be solved. Every other problem will solve itself. And the answer to that problem is in the first half. The first half is the catalyst for the second half. There are two things you can manage your first half for. You can have an outcome in the first half of saying I want to be successful in my first half. Or you can have your outcome in a first half where you say, I want to use my first half for being successful in the second half. You can have two career objectives for the first half. Yeah. Now, many choices you make, hopefully both the objectives are coinciding. What helps you succeed in the first half helps you succeed in the second half. Those are the easy choices to make. But there will be times when you have to make choices where what makes you feel successful in the first half is not going to help you in the second half. That's a trade-off. Huh. The trade-off. And that is where my strong advocacy is always make the trade-off in favor of what will help you in the second half. Give us an example. What you what do you have in mind? What are the yeah. kind of choices people, what are the mistakes people end up making here? Yeah, exactly. So, for example, one of the mistakes that people make is length of roles. Right? Uh, now, typically they want to get to the next role in 18 months in the first half. Yeah, they don't want to put in two and a half, three years in the in the current role. Because the next role is a promotion or it's possibly a slight salary increase and so on and so forth. Now, how does this impact when you get to the second half? In the first half, what tends to happen is a lot of your success is by conquering low-hanging fruit. So, typically in the first year of any job, 18 months of any job, there is enough low-hanging fruit in any role. And if you solve the low-hanging fruit, you have a degree of success, you look good. And on the basis of that, you can get a promotion, you can get a job, so on and so forth. Yeah. When you come to the second half, the job of leaders in the second half is to solve for high-hanging fruit. It is the juniors who solve for low-hanging fruit. You, you don't get to senior and again solve for low-hanging fruit. But in, if in your first half, you have never given yourself the time to solve high-hanging fruit, then you have never built the skill of solving high-hanging fruit. So, you end up being very successful in your first half by solving many low-hanging fruits. One fine day you come to the second half where what you need to succeed is solving high-hanging fruit and you have never built that capability. Now, to have built that capability, you needed to have some patience in the first half where you say, I give myself three years where in the first year I solve low-hanging fruit and then the second and third year I solve for the more complex high-hanging fruit. Yeah. Now, that skill building is a contradiction with my need for a promotion every 18 months. Right? So, that's an example. Got it. 
And I guess it goes back to the point about learning cycles. I guess the cycle needs to be long enough for you to get to the high hanging fruit. In any role, I guess early you start off with the easy wins. Exactly. So it sort of ties back to the point about uh, uh, lengthening the learning cycle. Molly's point about building muscle to tackle complex problems in the second half is an interesting one. I might add a related point here on my experience. As I see it, the big shift between the first half and the second half from a competency perspective is people leadership, both in terms of leading people reporting to you and in terms of working with peers and the ecosystem around you to drive outcomes. I find that people who have a good second half do two or three things in the first half. They build the people leadership capability over time, they seek feedback, they change behaviors, and they work on themselves to be effective with people. Second, they build an asset of relationships across the corporate world, whether it's with their colleagues, mentors, clients, vendors, consultants, and so on. And that cumulative difference really starts showing up in a telling way in the second half. I see several high IQ leaders take off in their careers like a rocket when they leave campus. But when it comes to the second half, it's often a lot less about how bright you are, but a lot more about whether you've built the capability to go after the high hanging fruit, as Molly says, and whether you have the people leadership competencies, and if you have the relationships in the ecosystem to open doors and get things done through trust. Thank you for listening. If you're new to the podcast and want to get a sense of the nature of content that's covered, you might want to go to YouTube and type Play to Potential highlights from 2017. I've tried to capture the key takeaways from my various conversations last year with leaders across disciplines, from people such as Zia Modi, Nanda Nilakeni, Vishi Anand, Vijay Amritraj, Amish Tripathi, Vinita Bali and the like. For more, please visit playtopotential.com where the content is organized by nuggets and tagged by themes so that you could get multiple perspectives on a topic that you care about. If you want to listen offline, say during a car ride home or during airplane travel, you could also access the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Savan or any of the other podcast apps out there. If you find the content purposeful, please go to iTunes and rate and review the show. It will help others discover it.